Thank you, Kristen. Thank you very much, Kristen. And I uh, want to thank uh, Susan, Carla, Luke, um, Bill for uh, putting on this wonderful session and uh, for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be here. And uh, it clearly is remarkable location um, when we, uh, we think about the challenges that are associated with actually learning um, what um, our discussions uh, are bringing to us, but also the challenge of seeing this beautiful pool and, uh, and if you don't have enough sunscreen, you know, going home a few days later. Pennsylvania right now is 32 degrees uh, up in the mountains where we live. So, uh, so if we go back with a burn, it, it'll be a, a badge of honor, I guess. So, um, so I want to thank you all. And, uh, and what I'm going to do is probably continue on a the theme of what David had just done a phenomenal job in, in summarizing. There's a tremendous amount of information there. But we're really going to focus in on ultrafiltration, one aspect of blood management that's near and dear to uh, all of our hearts. And uh, so let's begin. Uh, there's only a couple of goals that I want to um, go over in the next uh, 35 minutes or so. And we're going to look at developments. Uh, and I always put recent up there because it's very easy to go back. Ultrafiltration was first used in the 80s. And actually, some of the initial publications were perfusion as first author. So um, it's been around a long time, over 40 years. Anybody here not using ultrafiltration in their clinical practice? Uh, one person, that's great. Uh, I'm sorry for the uh, at home audience, one person raised their hand. Um, and so that's neat because we all have a tremendous amount of experience with it and a lot of background. And with that, um, you know, we're going to see if there's a sweet spot that perhaps uh, exists. And, uh, and I'm going to begin, you saw the title of this, so you know, clearly there's going to be some questions that arise with ultrafiltration. And uh, it's almost like stating that, um, you know, mother's milk really isn't all that it's, you know, uh, made out to be. I mean, this is something that is near and dear to all of our hearts. We use it um, a lot in our practices. So now, should we be, we be concerned with its use? Uh, let's begin with just a little bit of background information. Ultrafiltrators are made up of a variety of um, materials. They're all non-endothelialized, even though most of them are coated today. And most of them are made of polysulfone, which is, a relatively um, biocompatible surface and um, you know it has some benefits over some of the microporous uh, polypropylenes that are being used. Um, when you are using a ultrafiltrator, we know this curve very, very well. Um, you know, there's probably a cutoff point by which the, mole the molecular weight of the um, solutes that are being removed are set. And it's somewhere with an average of about 35,000, but it does go higher and it does go lower. Low molecular weight heparin, for example, has got a, mo um, a molecular weight of uh, 7,000 as opposed to heparin, which is in the 30,000 range. So if you are actually ultrafiltrating somebody who's come in on low molecular weight heparin, perhaps during a CRRT with ECMO, you're removing um, some of that anticoagulant through the, um, the ultrafiltrator. One thing to keep in mind, too, we all memorize sieving coefficients. You look at the very bottom here, potassium, sodium, phosphorus are removed. We've all used them to um, create ionic or to correct ionic imbalances. But it's, keep in mind, all of artificial surfaces have an electronegative charge. So there's an electrostatic influence that occurs um, as well. So anything that's negative that's going to be an, um, you know, an anion that's coming in, in contact with these uh, surfaces is going to have a certain repelling. So you can't use sieving coefficients based just upon molecular weight. A um, couple other review slides here, you know, ultrafiltration, the definition of um, ultrafiltration, it's uh, the connective flow of uh, water and dissolved solutes that are moved down a pressure gradient. We are also um, thinking about transmembrane pressure. It's a hydrostatic force uh, that's coming in. And you can see on the slide here for ultrafiltration, it's really what we describe as the fluid movement. But the convective movement of, um, of solutes is following that fluid out. So again, based on molecular weight, based on a number of influencing factors, both the positive side of the ultrafiltrator with fluid coming in and the negative side, what we do to that, applying vacuum or just letting free flow um, volume be removed. There's loads of different flavors of ultrafiltration. I mean, these have been around, as I mentioned, for decades. Muff was developed in the early 1990s. And so you can see this list right here. And the ones that we're going to focus in on are the primary ones, um, which are conventional ultrafiltration modified and zero balanced. In fact, that's where the majority of the research is um, that we're going to go over. Now, nobody in this room needs to read this slide because we can all um, um, basically cite it from memorization. What we, we know the proven benefits of an ultrafiltrator are. You know, it removes plasma water, importantly. And that, of course, changes not only the formed elements, primarily red blood cell, but also proteins are actually going to be hyper-concentrated. 
Um, it increases the coagulation factors, which is important. Some of the research that is done on post-operative modified ultrafiltration is, is stating that it improves the coagulation status of patients. Uh, oncotic pressure, if you're getting the, um, you know, the Donovan effect and getting proteins that are being raised, you're going to have an increase in osmotic pressure, and perhaps it limits blood loss. Uh, some of the possible benefits, even though we look at these as, yeah, that's, you know, I'm removing inflammatory uh, mediated cytokines, these, these molecules, so that's why I muff. Well, it really isn't proven. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of weak evidence that shows that it occurs, so these, that ends up in the possible benefits area. And if you are doing an uh, anti-inflammatory modus of operandi in regards to removing these, uh, these cytokines and various uh, factors that upregulate inflammation, you know, you're probably going to relate with a better, um, uh, better respiratory function thereafter because of less lung injury. Um, reduced transfusion requirements and perhaps a lower length of time in the hospital. Some of the concerns, um, you know, we, I think we, we tend to glaze over these and don't look at them carefully. First of all, it's unphysiologically. It's definitely bioincompatible, and it raises the surface area of our, our circuits. You know, membrane oxygenators now are anywhere between 1.5 and 2 square meters of surface area, and some of these uh, ultrafiltrators can be as high as a half a square meter of surface area, so it's a 25 to 30 percent increase in surface. Um, increases prime volume. Uh, David mentioned prime volume. We've done a lot of research on prime volume as well, and we know that if you can lower that, there's going to be an overall benefit, probably to a sweet spot. We've, we've actually found that once you get below 500, there's really no benefit to continuing to reduce that, at least in the normal patient. And, uh, those that perhaps could not be transfused, you want to get down lower. Um, create shunts of flow away from patients. How many of us in the room, you don't have to raise your hand, uh, I'm the one who um, it, you know, was guilty of this. How many of those at the time when you're running an ultrafiltrator, you fail to recognize that there's a diminution in the amount of forward blood flow that's arterialized to the patient and reducing um, what's going on? You know, hopefully not to the level that you see changes in oxygen consumption or increases in SVO2, but we know it occurs. And then finally, a few others here, increased hemolysis and circuit complexity and added costs. And, you know, getting into the minimally invasive extracorporeal circulation, I would, I bet most of us in the room here um, have, are not using it because of its complex nature, while our colleagues uh, abroad uh, have embraced this. So now let's look at a little data in regards to what's going on. Um, one of the largest registries that we have for perfusion data right now um, is in the, uh, what's maintained by specialty care. Um, comprehensive care services coming out with a wonderful one. Um, you know, we have Perform as well of, you know, about 50 hospitals and it's growing. Um, but we've um, got data going back to 2011 on about 2 million procedures, about 500,000 of those are cardiac procedures. So we have a lot of information. So what I did is I just sampled our data set um, over the last six years, uh, 225 hospitals. This probably represents about a fifth of all hospitals in the country and just a, under 190,000 patients. So if you look at this, uh, procedures, I'm sorry. If you look at this graph, the horizontal axis is going to be time um, and the uh, y-axis will be just a percent or some other indicator a variable as it comes up. And you can see we peaked at about 50% utilization in 2019. You saw that upward trend, and now it's, being, uh, it's actually coming down as overall percent of ultrafiltration. But if you look at volume, what's going on, and if I asked you everybody in the room right now, in the case you did before you came to this meeting, how much volume did you take off for your patient using an ultrafiltrator, you probably have a pretty good idea. But if you look at hundreds of thousands of cases and then look at a median and a mean distribution, you can see that it's almost um, verbatim that two liters of a mean volume comes off and the median is somewhere about 400 cc's less than that. So what it's worth. Now, let's look at procedures. Okay, everybody in the room is stating, you know, hey, when I'm doing valvular procedures, aortic procedures, you know, clearly I'm going to take more volume off. If I'm using Del Nido, if I'm using HTK, if I'm using, a, you know, a lot of crystalloid, if the anesthesiologist, you know, preloaded my patient and, you know, really wet them out, I'm going to give them, I'm going to use more. So if you look at the procedure type, and I'm sorry if you can't read this, but on the horizontal axis, we start on the far side is all. So this is all of our... 186,000, oh, excuse me, this is on 88,000 procedures. 
Um, and then the one right next to it is AVR, MVR. The yellow lines at the bottom are the number of cases in each one of these categories. This is something very easy to pull up when you have these large data sets and to separate and sort the information. And so you can see in the very bottom, you know, the procedures and on the very far right hand side is OPCAB conversions. So OPCAB conversions, if you were just looking at the raw data, volumetrics based upon mean and median, you come up with this and, you know, I, I don't think anybody would argue against this. But if you then go and normalize the data, and this is what most people do, most of the research you see on ultrafiltration, they're normalizing it to the kilogram body weight and over the time period of the bypass run, not when the ultrafiltration was done, but the bypass run. And that's important because when you look at dialysis information, which we will look at it very briefly, um, they're looking at it over the time period that the ultrafiltrator was used. We look at it over the bypass run. So there's gonna be a little bit of variability. And now we can see, look at that TAVR conversion. It migrated all the way from the right of the screen to the left of the screen. So when you have these procedures, the overall, um, at least mean of ultrafiltration, wide variability is the highest. And also, just as a little bit of a side, um, we've all probably had TAVR conversions. If you do have one, you take an individual who's coming in for, say, a, a straightforward aortic valve replacement, they get a TAVR. Historic data, more recent data, doesn't, hasn't shown this, but if you look at them, their risk of mortality based upon an STS risk stratification changes from somewhere about 6 to 8% to about 45%. So these are very high-risk individuals with very high mortality if they actually fail. So this type of distribution of analytics are something to keep in mind. All right, tongue-in-cheek now. So let's look at what occurred over these six years in regards to the amount of ultrafiltrate volume that were removed. The middle column is in milliliters, the right column is liters. And if you summarize all that, that comes out to about 170,000 liters of, over these 225 hospitals that were occurring during this six year period, or about 45,000 gallons. Now that's a very large data point to look at. So if you go ahead and normalize it to something that we consider, especially those of us in the Northeast who are approaching summertime, as I mentioned, it's, it's basically snowing back in the, um, Pennsylvania. We normally plan our garden right around Mother's Day, and so we're nowhere clear, clear, close to doing that because of the change in temperature. But if you were looking at a pool and you had one in mind that was, say, 10 foot in diameter, 30 inches deep, that actually equates to about 1,500 gallons. So if you do the math on um, what goes in with that, that amount of ultrafiltration in liters that took off over the six um, years of this study or of this data set shows that about 30 of these pools were filled in with that amount of volume that was removed from patients. So clearly a significant amount. Uh, Amazon, $786. My wife really wants to get one of these um, things, um, but, uh, but at least that's what it was the other day when I pulled this up. Let's continue to look at data just for a few minutes before we get into the science behind what's going on right now with the ultrafiltration. So as you all know, you know we're a big organization. We've got you know, a bunch of hospitals all throughout the country. And if we separate them into these, we, we used to use this type of separation for specialty care for our, or our hospitals. We had a Northeast, Midwest, South, and West. And if we look at the data, now this is really interesting. If anybody has an idea on this, I would love to serve as a co-author uh, on this paper with you because I have no clue why this is occurring. So, so keep that in mind. So if you look at those four regions of the United States, the ultrafiltration use, this was on 93,000 cases. Um, this is over a two or three year period. And if you look at the red is the Northeast, 62% of our hospitals in Northeast were using ultrafiltration, 62% of all the cases. Um, the orange is West, 60%, but look at the South and the Midwest, you know, almost half that. So those of you who are practicing in the Midwest or the South perhaps can address this, and that's all fine and good. You know, it's just an observational point. But then you look at the, um, the volume that comes off with this in regards to urine output. Now, this is the first time I'm gonna discuss this. I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about the critical nature of urine output during cardiopulmonary bypass. Look at the urine output, just observationally. In the Northeast, you take off um, 1,320 cc's that are being removed in ultrafiltration volume, and here you have a urine output that's 511 versus 750 with the far right, which is gonna be the south. So this was the first observational phenomena that we looked at that said, hey, we gotta, you know, in fact, every research project in the history of mankind began with two words. Two, this is true. I read this in an editorial in the American College of Cardiology back in the 80s. Anyone wanna take a guess what those two words are? And you've, we've all done it. I don't say you've done it, we've all done it. It's, that's interesting. 
I mean, every research project in the history, because once you get that, that's the precipice, that's the beginning of going ahead and developing a hypothesis to go on and to evaluate what we do. Most of us then turn to the literature. You looked at, as Dave had pointed out, you know, highly um, revered literature at the highest level of the hierarchy of what's being published. Um, but that's interesting, is how all research begins. If you further look at this, this very top graphic on the next two or three slides is going to be the volume. So you can see the Northeast takes off the most volume, and then you want to look at nadir hematocrit. Most people believe today that a nadir hematocrit, any time during an admission during a cardiac surgical procedure for the routine patient, if it gets below 24, bad things happen. You know, remember, we used to do 15, 18, 21. Um, most of the data that's evolved over the last decade has told us we probably should be in a little bit higher area. And even the randomized trials, such as Tricks and Tracks, are each saying that as well. So if you look at the nadir hematocrit, they're pretty similar across the groups. But as you start looking at transfusion, now the South has got the lowest volume of um, ultrafiltration that's being removed, and they've got the highest transfusion rate. Aha, uh -huh, here it is, write the paper. You know, if you take up a lot of volume, you're not going to transfuse. Well, let's wait a minute, because obviously this is not a, a controlled, highly revered study. This is just observational. Causation and observation don't match. This is probably just an association. So let's look at this. Let's look what's going on right now. There are a lot of meta-analyses and systematic, systematic reviews that have been done on ultrafiltration. It's so nice to go ahead and go to one place. Don't bother me with the 30 papers or the 80 papers. Let's just look at what's out there, and I'll go ahead and give my bottom line. Read the last sentence in the conclusion, and that's the take-home message. Well, there's real problems with that. This particular group of researchers is um, working with the Cochrane database and analytics to go ahead and identify how can we set forward um, future studies that will look at the value of meta-analysis? This is not done. This is just telling the methodology of how it should be done. But what's missing, if you read this, they're not going to be looking at the type of ultrafiltration, the methodologies, the quantification of volume, the rate of removal of fluid balance. I mean, those are extremely important and something that should uh, be done. So let's just review a couple of meta-analyses. Here is one um, that was uh, from SUNY Downstate Medical Center. They looked at 8,500 patients. Uh, 22 studies, and most of these are published within the last couple of years. I didn't go back more than that. I tried not to anyway. So when you use conventional or continuous ultrafiltration, you can see there's a reduced perioperative bleeding, uh, lower red blood cell transfusion, ICU stay is good. So, you know, write the paper, go home, let's start doing it. Until you look at the numbers and you look at the difference between these groups and you can see the reduced perioperative bleeding, well, that was 108 cc's and the total amount of chest tube drainage that occurred. The red blood cell tr transfusion, well, that probably is, is, you know, important. You know, about three quarters of a unit of blood. How many people gave three quarters of a unit of blood in the last, uh, you know, 20 years? I mean, it just doesn't occur. And then in ICU stays, congratulations, you got out 3.8 hours earlier. If the nurse or the transfer person wasn't able to take you out of the ICU, that probably for 3.8 hours, or it was lunchtime or a Friday afternoon, that probably is what is, is shown there. So, um, and what also they had said was that there are no differences, and look at these outcome indicators in regards to the important stuff that's going on with what we really are interested in. You know, do patients really do better? And the answer is no, um, overall. In fact, I want to put a cautionary um, sign out to everybody right now for publications. Over the last maybe decade, um, you start seeing this on the bottom of the publication, usually on the first page. So this paper was received on July 2nd. It was accepted on July 13th and then published July 23rd. We have three papers in right now, one in the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery, one in Critical Care Medicine, and one in JECT. The Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery is on revision. We're about eight weeks out on that. The CCM paper is three months out, and uh, JECT, they're just reviewing it. And if you look at the impact factor of certain journals, you know, most of these are not very high impact factors when you see these publications. Uh, the Annals of Thoracic Surgery is 6.3. Uh, Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery is 5.4, I believe. Uh, perfusion is 1.7. Um, so let's look at another one. This was a study out of Hunan, um, and it was act, uh, com comparing modified ultrafiltration in adults. Okay, this is adults. And we can see that, what do you find? Increased both bypass somatocrit, chest tube out, but you can read this. I mean, this is, you know, again, very uplifting type of information until you start looking at the values, the difference between the groups that were being analyzed. Chest tube output was dropping by 100 cc's, almost identical to the other. Remember, a lot of these are looking at the exact same studies. They start with several hundred, and then they whittle down to six or eight is where they're, they're ending up with. 
Again, the transfusion requirements in here are 3.1 hours. So, you know, this is very similar data because they're looking at the same published research. Um, what about the effects of um, modified ultrafiltration in children? And now most of these are co combinations. They're combining MUF and CUF together, or they're looking at CUF. So it's, it's not clear type of methodology. It's not something that really should be in a systematic review or a meta-analysis. And so the findings are increased hematocrit um, and no effect on some of these outcome indicators. But the reason I put this particular um, study up is they did what we all do right now when we publish papers, excuse me, and that is you identify the limitations with your study. All right, identify your limitations. So our meta-analysis has some limitations, and this is what you'll find on most of these, and all studies, actually, if you're going to get published in a peer-reviewed journal today. So what are the limitations? They didn't analyze a lot of the data because it was missing. They, um, the evidence strength of pooled outcomes is not so reliable. Well, that's what basically a meta-analysis is, an aggregate analysis. These outcomes not mentioned in including trials, uh, half the trials didn't have the same outcomes that were, they didn't look at the same variables, and then finally heterogeneity uh, bias uh, always finds its way into meta-analyses and systematic reviews, and that's why you have multiple people doing, and that's why you should find, follow specific uh, processes and standards to make sure that they don't occur. Um, well, here's a recent one. This is, uh, God bless Jeff, you know, but this was a paper that was just published, um, and this was ultrafiltration cardiac surgery. It's not associated with AKI. Great. Write the paper. You know, that's what I'll go with. Until you look at the methodology, the methodology that went into this, 12 studies um, included non-randomized studies, so that's very low type of observational study overall and looking at the high of evidence support. They used different ultrafiltration types. Six of them were cuff. Two of them were MUF, a couple of combinations. So you can see, they didn't even look at the same type of ultrafiltration standards, highly variable methods of ultrafiltration that shouldn't really have been done. 10 studies have an average of 100 patients, and then uh, four studies were younger than 10 years of age. I know, historical information that's being done. And again, that pesky type of submission and review pops up. Um, October, it was submitted, accepted 30 days later, published four or five days after that. It's bizarre. I mean, it really, really is when you see this. And how bizarre is it? In the four days that I've been here, um, I have actually received six invitations to submit papers to various journals, six. This was from the 23rd and through the 27th. And everybody in the room is probably getting these. You're always getting bombarded with people, with uh, editors or editorial staff asking you to come and submit your research to them because there's such a preponderance of publications that are out, out there right now. They're all vying for the same type of research and submissions and manuscripts with, with others. And most of these, not all of them, most of these have impact factors, if they're even um, cited, of under one. So, and so that's why when you get these publications and you start quoting them, you have to be very careful with regards to the methodology. So let's shift for the remaining of the um, talk to go into the controversies surrounding, um, surrounding um, conventional ultrafiltration today. And this is my only dialysis slide. And I put this up. Anybody here doing dialysis, plasmapheresis? Um, patients, a few, CRRT for the audience at home, maybe about five or six people raised their hand. Well, these are all the associated problems that occur with dialysis. We think it's pretty benign, and this is, this is hemodialysis. This is blood um, um, dialysis. And you can see on the left-hand side here where the person is shown with this dialysis machine that all of the changes that are occurring um, to an already very challenged and sick population that probably um, increases the chances of adverse events associated with them. So some of the concerns, this was a study, this is I think the oldest study that I have um, right now, excuse me, this is the summarization from the editorialization of that particular um, editorial which was written about a paper that I'll review in just a second. And they said the problem is there are low number of primary trials, there are small sample sizes with ultrafiltration, is also conflicting results. And here is a study that occurred um, 12 or 13 years ago, and this was um, out of, um, I believe it was South America, and this was looking at a combination of cuff, muff, and combined um, treatments published in perfusion, and they found no difference whatsoever in adult patients that were undergoing uh, any of these ultrafiltration um, events. Uh, Dave did a wonderful job of really looking at the history behind uh, how uh, clinical practice guidelines get uh, published, and, and I want to, you know, 
you draw attention to that a little bit more because one of the nice things is when you have an organization that is um, centralized in one place. When I, I worked my entire career in hospitals where maybe I managed three at the most, so I might have had 10 or 11 perfusionists. But once you get into a large group practice, it's so nice when you get these clinical practice guidelines because you can proliferate them uh, throughout your entire organization uh, very quickly, especially at the, at the highest level of uh, evidence and strength. So, so here's the uh, 2007 guidelines, and, Je and Dave did talk about um, uh, recommendations, but in 2007, uh, continuous ultrafiltration was a class three recommendation. Uh, uh, relatively low level of evidence. However, in 2011, MUF elevated to class one. And at the same time, actually, they did look at CUF and ZBUF, and that was a 2B recommendation. My opinion and take on it, 2B, is flip a coin. You know, it just doesn't have enough information to go ahead and support its use. But if you see a class one or a class 2A, those you have to look at real carefully and then rule out that you're not going to practice, uh, incorporate that clinical practice guideline. Class three is a no-brainer, don't do it. Um, but for the most part, 2B is that gray zone. And I think a lot of biases of, uh, on these clinical practice guideline committees place um, information in 2B when you really don't have a good um, a feeling of what the outcome would be. It's a safe place to make a recommendation. And as David said, this year we're a 2B for MUF. So we went from a 1A to a 2B. Um, and that's because when we reviewed this information, we found that we were using a lot of pediatric information and that was not viable in the adult and we were doing just adult clinical practice guidelines. By the way, the Europeans have also rated this as a 2B. Um, and so, but what we did is when we put this out, the guidelines were sent out for public review to anesthesiologists, surgeons, and perfusionists. Uh, you probably all have seen them or if you go check your email from about nine months ago, you may see that it's in there. And what it was was, what do you think about these? And we did get one challenge, one or more, it might have been a couple, and they said, you guys are off base with your modified ultrafiltration, you're totally wrong. This is, you know, this is great, this is what we should be doing. So we went back, we went back and reviewed all the papers again. A couple of us uh, went, pulled all the papers, reviewed them again, and we came to consensus of opinion that it truly is a 2B recommendation. So let's move on right now to a randomized clinical trial. This was on ultrafiltration, uh, 283 cardiac surgical patients. It was in Egypt, I believe. And they had, um, they had about an equal match of patients that were getting ultrafiltration who were not. And now you're gonna start seeing some changes in interoperative urine output. This is during the, the bypass procedure and pre and post um, anesthesia before the patient left the room. So we could see the urine output was much lower in the ultrafiltration group, and then there was a lactatemia that developed at the same time, an acidemia that occurs. So, and th this is well described in the dialysis literature because what happens is you have a, a removal of various um, uh, cations as well as anions uh, from the solution, and primarily bicarbonate is being ultrafiltrated as well. So you see an acidemia that is occurring frequently with the use of ultrafiltration. Um, the question occurs is, well, what is the etiology? I mean, why is this occurring? Um, well, people are saying that if you are ultrafiltrating and definitely doing a lot of volume, you're getting a hypotension that is occurring that re results in vasopressor use, a hypoperfusion to the renal uh, infrastructure, and you also have some perhaps elevated plasma oncotic pr pr pressures and cellular dehydration. In a few minutes, we'll go over that and actually look at some of the work that Dr. Conrad had reported on, um, on uh, Wednesday. So when to use uh, ultrafiltration, and then this is the um, a summarization of Solomon's work, and they said to go ahead and do it when you have impaired renal function, excessive positive fluid balance, uh, reduced response to diuretics, and however, use it sparingly during cardiopulmonary bypass. Better options, um, not only to reduce the amount of volume you're giving, but to think about autologous priming and MIAC, and we're gonna talk about those in just a little bit. This was a really interesting paper. It came out of the Mayo Clinic, and this, I think, really is extremely important. This was a, a retrospective study on 2,400 patients, um, and what they did was they were looking at the effect of fluid balance on postoperative acute kidney injury, but they looked at aortic valves. You know, individuals who are getting aortic valve, and that, I think, is critical, because most of the research that's done is on first-time coronaries. It's a good homogeneous data set to get. They're mostly us men, you know, in our 60s, and, you know, for the most part, we're not anemic when we come for our first-time coronary. So it's a great 
set of, of great population to go ahead and do research on. This is not so bad a population because these were AVRs and they used different criteria to assess acute kidney injury and you can see what they were looking at on uh, the right hand side. Um, they said the dogma today, what we all accept is that patients who have a positive postoperative fluid balance end up with increased ICU time, they spend more, more time in the hospital, bigger readmission rate, uh, got high more mortality. I mean, this is kind of stuff we all probably would, if I asked you to um, write this down, you probably all would have, have written it down. I know I would have. Um, however, the methodology in this particular thing, they looked at all ins and outs, and then they wanted to look at ultrafiltration and urine outputs, and their primary outcome was AKI. So on the left-hand side, we see the median intraoperative urine output. It wasn't statistically significant, but on the horizontal axis was the total fluid balance. And you'll see this on a couple of figures coming up. So the far left had, you know, your uvolemic. You know, this is, you, you don't have any volume, it was perfect. You know, I took off all the volume that was given in the operating room, patient hit the ICU, and was uvolemic. Um, doesn't occur frequently, but people are trying to do that. And then on the far right-hand side, here's a really wet patient, you know, probably 40 mils per kilogram. But what they had found on the right-hand side was urine output was basically inversely related to what was going on with total fluid balance so that the um, highest urine output was occurring where you had a zero, um, um, zero basically milliliters per kilogram of body fluid that it was occurring in totality. Now, if you looked at the median ultrafiltrate volume, and on the, the left-hand side, 3,000. So here's, here's perfusionists aggressively going ahead and taking volume off. I mean, three liters. That's a, that's a 1,400 cc's more than the standard in America today. And then if you look on the right-hand side, you see there's a concurrent or an associative um, reaction, this was a retrospective study, in regards to the amount of urine output. And so although ultrafiltration um, was not directly associated with AKI in the study, the excessive volume that was taking off definitely led to um, an increased risk for uh, basically um, an, over an over violation, more fluid balance that was in the patient, and then it needed uh, thereafter a greater uh, postoperative resuscitation in regards to the fluid that was given. Here's the fluid balance again summarized. On the left-hand side, we see that the risk of AKI was highest in these aortic valve patients when you had uvolemia or zero balance. And so these individuals came out and, and stated uh, with a multiple log logistic regression that if you did have a positive fluid balance, you can see you were one and a half times more likely to have a myocardial infarction. And then if you looked at ultrafiltration and ult um, volume, um, whoops, Okay, there was a problem with Microsoft. <laughs> Let's see, it's probably gonna reopen right now. That's how they let you know you're done with your presentation. So that's who shot Kennedy, and if anybody wants to know. <laughs> All right, let's see this. I guess I gotta open the paper here. Let's see if we go right back to where we were. Whoops, didn't. Let me get to that location. Here we go. And I'll just uh, slideshow. There we are. Um, and I was on this slide right here. So if you look at the ultrafiltration risk, of almost a twofold increased risk of actually developing um, death at the end of this particular study in this large patient volume, and that was related to uh, ultrafiltration volume. The more ultrafiltration volume that was off, the higher risk for overall mortality. So let's take a second right now and summarize urine flow. Everybody's measuring urine flow. Anybody here want to do a cardiopulmonary bypass case without a catheter with a, a non algoyuric patient? No, we always want to have a urine catheter in. And there's a number of papers. This first one was by Hori and Associates. It was 503 cardiac surgical patients. And on the right-hand side of these next two, you'll see what the outcome was. And they had stated that a urine output less than 1.5 mils per kg per hour resulted in increased um, risk for AKI, and that for every 0.5 milliliter drop less than that, the risk increased by 26%. Um, this particular study was out of Turkey, and this was um, um, predicting that urine output could predict AKI with urine output underneath 0.3.6 mils, having a two to four pole increase in AKI. And then finally, uh, just another summary paper. This one was um, um, out of uh, South Korea, and this one said that AKI was significantly lower when urine output was um, higher 
and um, that uh, the amount, excuse me, that urine output was lower and significantly higher when ultrafiltrate volume was high. So why is that occurring? Um, just a couple of other background information on this. This was an individual study that looked at liver dysfunction that was occurring, again, at the Mayo Clinic. It was a 10-year study of 360 patients. And what they had shown was independent association of ultrafiltrate volume with overall liver dysfunction. So the more ultrafiltrate volume that was taken off during the cardiopulm, um, during the, excuse me, this was uh, an individuals who were going VAD insertion, so during the VAD insertion, the more ultrafiltrate volume was off, the more likely they had AKI. So we became interested in this, and Linda and the team um, looked at actually the assessment of um, uh, ultrafiltration on the effect of end cardiopulmonary bypass hematocrit. And what we found serendipitously, if you look on the right-hand side through logist logistic regression, is that the more ultrafiltration volume that you took off, the lower the urine output was. So that was like an observation. It was like a, a serendipitous finding that we had with this particular study. It was confirmed in a consecutive study that also had shown that ultrafiltrate volume um, was directly or inversely related to the amount of urine output that was occurring. Um, th and there wasn't a significant benefit. Ultrafiltration based upon a, uh, this was 41,000 patients, um, did not have an effect on reducing red blood cell transfusion. And others have shown this as well. And then more recently, we looked at zero balance ultrafiltration. And if you, I put the graph up on the right, because how many people here do Z-buff? Yeah, I would, I would say a fair number. For the folks at home, that was about half of the audience. There's a lot of questions with Z-buff, a lot, a lot of questions with it, but I think most of us use it. And if you can see that distribution curve, um, that's the number of um, hospitals that are using it more than 10% of the time. And um, on this um, multiple logistic regression analysis that was done, the number one determinant for urine output in regards to variability was the weight of the patient, but second was ultrafiltration volume. So clearly some information that is coming up and it's generated. Now, this wasn't a profound effect. It said for each liter of Z-buff, you reduce your urine, out, urine output by 0 0.03 mils per kilogram. You know, you try to get this through publication, and, you know, this is, this is observational study, but it was done with relatively straightforward statistical analyses. And, you know, what happens if you have an individual who's at an increased risk of developing AKI is that reduction in urine output as it, you're going two, three, four liters, is that impor important? And it's a question we all have to answer. Um, one of the last studies that I have are just a couple left in regards to what's going on in the pediatric environment. This was at a CHOP, and they looked at 530 patients. These were less than one year old. And they had shown that patients, um, about 12% of them, 64 of their individuals developed AKI, and there was a sweet spot. So that if you were close to 120 mils per kilogram, you actually didn't um, develop the AKI, but if you were um, more than that, you could see how it straightens out on the graph. If you were less than that, I'm sorry, less than 119, there was an increased risk of developing AKI. So they um, were concerned and stated that ultrafiltration should be um, only used intermittently, and then if you go ahead and categorize your patients by high risk or low risk, it didn't matter. Ultrafiltration still was an independent risk factor for overall generation of AKI in pediatric patients as far as uh, could have been threefold higher than those patients who were below, um, or excuse me, that above the 119 level. And then this particular study, again, was, uh, this is the one I mentioned earlier, that editorial that I started with. This is Mike Manning out of Duke. He looked at um, uh, 1,600 uh, patients. These were cabbage valve patients. And they had found that cuff volume, when it approached 32 cc's per kilogram, resulted in significant harm to the patients, uh, did not reduce allogeneic transfusion, and they came out with the recommendation of not to use cuff, especially in those high levels, those high values that you're taking off. Um, and then finally, this particular study was on miniature, oh, this is what to do, what, what can we do instead of um, ultrafiltration? Well, uh, Dave mentioned earlier, um, MIAC, you know, minimally invasive extracorporeal circulation, it's the bomb in Europe and other places. Um, so, you know, wh what can we do instead? Well, here's a study that was um, out of the Children's Hospital in Guangdong, uh, China, and they investigated whether mini circuits really had an effect. And what they had said is we stopped using ultrafiltration. We went from 70% use down to 12% use, and the overall um, volume of urine was direct or inversely related to the ultrafiltration use. So the less ultrafiltration related and greater urine output. 
Um, we did something similar looking at autologous priming. Um, and we had found that, you know, once you standardize autologous prime within your institution, this is a 1A recommendation, it's a no-brainer. In fact, I think 98% of our hospitals are using RAP. Um, when you do this, your use of ultrafiltration dropped from 76% um, to 9%, and what happened with the urine output, that also increased. So um, clearly there's something going on here. So let's summarize and try to come up with what the reason is that we're seeing this phenomena. Um, compartmentalization of fluids, we know this very well. We studied this for our board examinations. We know there's a distribution of fluids. Most of the volume is found in the intracellular location. But there are these other two intravascular and interstitial locations that fluid migrates. Those pass very easily. Fluid moves across the capillary membrane very um, quickly based upon osmosis and other factors, hydrostatic pressure. So we know this is occurring. On the output on the top left, if you look at all of those factors, this is in the normal body. One thing to keep in mind is once we put an ultrafiltrator in those, those are all very slow processes. Once you put an ultrafiltrator in, you exacerbate them. These uh, speed up. The ultrafiltration rate is grossly, uh, grossly influenced. So multiple studies in the dialysis realm have shown that the ultrafiltration rate, the faster you take off the ultrafiltration rate, the worse patients do. And this particular study was um, out of University of Calif California in Irvine, and they looked at um, uh, close to 8,000 patients, and what they had found was that's the urine output in the middle graphs um, right there, that the more ultrafiltration volume that came out in these dialysis patients, the lower the urine output. These weren't allegoric patients, these were aneuric patients. So these were individuals who actually were still making urine, but the faster you took off the volume, the worse they did with their residual kidney function. Another aspect to consider about why this may be recurring is, you know, we talked about the glycocalyx. I first actually learned about this in the mid-80s, and I'll never forget it because it's a Greek term, glycocalyx, it's a proteoglycan, but it's it translated as sweet husk because it's loaded with these proteoglycans and sugar molecules. Uh, I had no idea what it was other than memorizing that what the uh, glycocalyx meant. Um, but it does, it is affected for cardiopulmonary bypass and definitely for um, inflammatory processes that upregulate the processes. And this basically causes that capillary permeability to increase, so no longer does it have the same starling effects that we see in the intact membrane. So the Goldilocks phenomena, it's really about fluid management and cardiac surgery. I think it's important as summarization to state that no one size fits all. You know, if you're taking off a lot of volume, that's probably not a good thing. So where is the sweet spot? Well, it's going to be directly related to the type of disease process that you're treating. We, we saw from the Mayo Clinic that the more volume you take off, the, the less well patients are going to do from an aortic valve perspective. It's volume dependent. That's what I mean by aortic valve. Elective versus urgent procedures. A lot of the procedures we have now, the acuity of our patients has changed dramatically. Whether it's done in the, or the OR or the ICU, you know, I've talked to a few people today and it's like, oh man, I get my patient out pretty well, but then you go into the ICU and you look what happens. If you get your patient out of the operating uvolemic and you go in the ICU, you're going to see two open bags of either a balanced electrolyte solution, albumin, you know, hopefully not a uh, formed element of blood, but you're going to see that going in. In fact, the STS tells us this as perfusionists, you know, what percent of first-time coronaries get transfused in an operating room? Um, looking at millions of patients, 20%. That's the, that's the data, that's the most recent data. So that's cool, I didn't transfuse. What percent get transfused in the ICU? An additional 30%. So you didn't transfuse them in the OR, congratulations, they're getting a unit or two units of blood once they hit the ICU, uh, and that's you know, reported by the STS. So it's important that what we do in the OR follows through to what we're going doing in the ICU. And of course, post-operative period, we look at the presence of fluid management in regards to AKI and respiratory function. And then finally, fluid type. Um, and the fluid type, um, oh, it's rebuffering. Let's see if it shuts down again. I'm just about done, so this is, this is great. Um, doesn't like me, I guess. But uh, what happens with the fluid type is balanced electrolyte solutions versus crystalloid. We had this discussion on Wednesday. New England Journal of Medicine just published the uh, PLUS trial. Uh, came out uh, about two months ago. And it said there's no difference in outcome measurements for critically ill individuals who were given, this was a 2,000 patient study uh, out of Australia and New Zealand, if you're using a balanced electrolyte solution versus um, normal saline, which obviously is not normal. And we have to keep that in mind because what is occurring in that particular um, uh, finding is the fact that the physiologic salines that are being used with balanced electrolyte solutions may not be beneficial with the caveat 
as more patients present for heart failure, that, that sodium load actually is gonna be detrimental. I uh, just had a procedure uh, last week, an elective procedure, and I was sitting there on the gurney and the nurse came over and I looked and she hung plasmalite. You know, she, my IV was plasmalite. I said to her, hey, you wanna save a lot of money for your institution? Go ahead and recommend that they switch to sodium chloride because most of the research is not showing that it's any beneficial. And she was the one, this is, I didn't read this, she was the one that said, yeah, I'd like to do that except heart failure patients are occurring more you know, we see them more frequently. So that was a, a duh on, on my part. So that's why a lot of times if you do go into uh, um, hospitals, you'll see that these balanced electrolyte solutions. Anybody here using saline for their prime? Normal saline? Nobody. So we all use uh, balanced electrolyte solutions. Okay, so the next slide that I was going to show you um, since the computer locked down here. Oh, you know what? Let me see if I can end this. Um, and I apologize for the... Uh, for whatever is going on here. But um, the next slide was a picture of Charlton Heston. Anybody remember Charlton Heston in 1986 came out when he was the president of the NRI, held up a, a musket in his hand or you know, flintlock or something, and he said, anybody who wants to t you know, take this particular uh, gun out of my hand can take it out of my cold, dead hand, was his quote. So with that, you know, when we are thinking about ultrafiltration, what are we doing in regards to changing our practice? We're not saying to stop ultrafiltration, but we're clearly saying to go ahead and think about what we're doing, especially when we're getting into the high volume areas, including the Z-buff. And my very last slide was, it's okay to shoot the um, messenger um, if he was or she was saying something opposite to what you believe with. So with that, I'm gonna end there and would be more than happy to get shot or discuss any of the findings that we